So for the most part, I think you guys should be able to remember. Um, but yeah, we are in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And I won't tell you what page number it is, because I don't think any of you guys have read the Bible. Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 is what we'll be studying. Um, again, because of the, the broken up nature of, of this series, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 5, um, so that way it makes more sense uh, as we read. So if you guys could follow along with me as I read verses 1 through 5. It starts and Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, uh, as we come to your word and as we come to this amazing passage, um, I pray that you open up our eyes and to um, just the greatness of the salvation you offer us, Lord. Um, the greatness of your sacrifice and the greatness of your love. Um, and Lord, I just uh, pray that, that your word would, um, would pierce our hearts tonight. And that your spirit would be upon us. And I just pray this all in your name. Amen. Okay, so if you didn't know, my favorite show in the entire Entire world is Avatar: The Last Airbender. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you should. It's amazing. It's it's the greatest bit of TV that's ever existed. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so Avatar: The Last Airbender, and I finally get to talk about it in a message because it fits so well. Okay, so the reason why I'm bringing up this show is because there are two characters in particular that have a super compelling relationship. Those characters are Aang and Zuko. I have a picture of them. There they are. Aang is the little short guy, and Zuko is the taller, hairy guy. Okay, now, Aang is the hero of this show. And Zuko, for a long time, is Aang's enemy. Zuko is the crown prince of an evil nation called the Fire Nation. And, he, and the Fire Nation is bent on conquering the world. And Aang, who is the Avatar, is the only person who is able to stop the Fire Nation and save the world from their evil. Okay, and from the beginning of the show, it is Zuko's mission to capture and stop Aang. They are on opposite sides of the war. They are enemies. Zuko is evil. He is selfish, he's proud, he's hateful, and he's destructive. Aang is kind, humble, loving, he's altruistic, and he would not hurt a spider fly trapped in his own web. Yeah. <laughs> but in one of the episodes, Zuko fights one of Aang's friends, and he gets knocked unconscious. Okay, and he's knocked unconscious in the middle of the North Pole during a blizzard. And everyone is just content with leaving him there. But Aang sees Zuko, he looks at him, and sees that he is helpless. And Aang says, we have to save him. And everyone's like, you're crazy, Aang. He's the one who keeps trying to kill you. He's the one who keeps trying to kidnap you. Just leave him. And then Aang looks at Zuko again, and he says, no. If we leave him, he'll die. Zuko was helpless. He was broken. He was a dead man. And Aang, who is 
is compassionate, kind, and altruistic, sees his enemy Zuko's helplessness, and he takes pity on him. Aang saves Zuko, because Zuko's helplessness stirs up in Aang his compassion. You guys, the more that we study sin, the more that we understand what it means that we are God's enemies, the more it should make sense to us that God would pour out his wrath upon us. People deserve the punishment that's coming. We deserve death. We deserve to go to hell for bringing the curse of sin, death, disease, pain, and evil into God's perfect and beautiful creation. Which is why these two verses that we'll be studying through today, verses 4 and 5, should be shocking to us. I mean, seriously. If you went into someone's home, vandalized their house, killed all of their plants, drowned their dog, beat their children, and then burned the whole thing to the ground. Would you expect that father of that house to save you? Ever? No, of course not. You would expect that father to pour out his wrath upon you the first chance that he gets. You guys, that's the position that our sin puts us in with God. We should assume and expect that God would send us to hell for what we have done. It would be strange if he didn't punish you for your sin. So why did God save you? Why did he save me? Why does he save anyone? You know, over the last two weeks, we have asked the questions, why do we need to be saved, and what are we being saved from? You know, we know that we need to be saved because of our sin, and that we are saved from Satan, we are saved from ourselves, and we are saved from God's wrath. But today, you and I are going to dig into why God saves us. We know that he does. But honestly, the better that you and I understand the depths of our own sin, the harder it becomes to understand why he would save us. We are his enemy. Why would he save us? And to answer that question, we need to study who God is and understand how his character supersedes punishment that we deserve. And the first fundamental characteristic of God that we see in these two verses is God's mercy. Look at verse 4 again with me. It says, but God being rich in mercy. Now guys, before we even get into God's mercy, I do want to just take a second to talk about the big but in verse 4. Okay? I can't believe no one laughed. <laughs> it's like, it's like, way to go, guys. <laughs> so, anyway, this is our chance to talk about the big but in verse 4. Alright, verses 1 through 3 talk all about your sin. Okay? It talks about your sin, it talks about my sin, it talks about what comes from our sin talks about the wrath that we deserve, the slavery that you and I are in, and the evil of our hearts. And then Paul writes the biggest but in the entire Bible. Okay, it says, you are a sinner, but God. Right? There you go, it's coming. Okay, you, are, you deserve wrath, but God. You could not control your passions, but God. You are a slave to Satan. But God, you had no hope. But God. You guys, the incredible fact about God being God is that he has the power to flip the script. 
everything about us in verses 1 through 3 is unchangeable fact until it is confronted by God. As powerful as sin is, as powerful as Satan and death are, they are powerless in the face of God. You see, this but God statement that Paul makes is effectively saying, all these things were true of you. Sinner is who you were. You were a slave. You were following Satan. You were, by nature, a child of wrath, living according to the passions of your flesh. But God said, no. Those things are no longer true of you. This statement that Paul makes highlights that nothing, not even sin, Satan, and death, can resist God's authority. You guys, God is unbearably powerful, which is incredibly comforting, because he is also intrinsically good. You see, the first thing that Paul writes after proclaiming God's power is to point out that God is rich in mercy. And here's what's unique about God's mercy. It doesn't say that God gives a lot of mercy. It doesn't say that God acts with mercy. Paul writes that God is mercy. Mercy is in his nature. Mercy is a part of who God is. God was not merciful, he would not be God. And the nature of God's mercy makes it so much more secure for us. See, God doesn't choose to give mercy or not give mercy on sin. God is always wanting to give mercy because it's who he is. And Paul doesn't just say that God is merciful. Paul says that God is rich in mercy. God overflows with mercy. God abounds with mercy. God cannot contain his mercy. God's mercy is so extra that it spills out of him. Okay, and so if mercy is so important to who God is, what is it? Right? What is mercy, and why does it lead God to save us? Now, guys, the easy-to-remember definition is to say that mercy is not getting what you deserve. Or to say that giving someone mercy is not giving them what they deserve. But again, in this verse, mercy is not an action so much as a part of who God is. See, God's mercy is more like a thing inside of him that stirs up his compassion. And it's God's feeling of compassion that leads him to save us. Okay, if you want proof that this is who he is, read any one of Jesus' miracles. Because almost all of them were done because Jesus felt compassion for a person, for a group of people. And he healed them, fed them, save them. And guys, to give you an example from my own life, when I saw this same idea play out, um, it was a while ago with my daughter, Sarah. Um, so she did something wrong, as she does. Um, uh, and I honestly can't remember what it was. It was a while ago, and uh, the only thing that I remember is that it was, it was bad. Like, it wasn't it wasn't normal Sarah mischief, okay? Um, and I remember this because I was super angry about it. Like, I was so angry about what she had done. Um, and I was so angry that I actually saw Beth watching me while I was reprimanding her to make sure that I didn't go too far in disciplining her, okay? Um, and so uh, Sarah had done this thing, and Sarah saw my anger about what she had done, and she fell to like Sarah started sobbing, she fell to the ground, she started just like 
wailing how sorry she was. She was a mess. Okay? But here's the thing about Sarah saying sorry. You see, she's very quick to apologize. She's very quick to say sorry for things. But often, it's just words. It's an empty apology. Because she's trying to get out of discipline. Okay? Like, she does something wrong, and she's like, I'm sorry, please don't spank me. Right? And, and so, like, it feels really empty. And so I told her, as she's apologizing to me, I was like, I know you're sorry, but what you did was wrong. And you deserve to be disciplined. And she goes, I know, I'm so sorry. Like, just tears streaming down her face. Is it? And I'll be honest, as I'm watching my little girl sobbing on the floor, as I see how sad she is, as I see how broken she is about what she had done, as I saw my daughter's remorse, God stirred up something inside of me. I felt compassion for her, and my anger melted away. And as my anger melted away, I took pity on her. I sat down on the floor with her. I sat her on my lap, and I said, Sarah, what you did was wrong, and you deserve to be disciplined. And she cried again, and I was like, I know. And I said, Sarah, you deserve to be disciplined, but I'm going to give you mercy. And she got confused because she doesn't know what that word means. <laughs> and so, so then I said, Sarah, I'm not going to discipline you. And she looked up and she's like, really? I'm like, really? And she sort of snuggled into me and said, I love mercy. <laughs> I was like, me too. You guys. The reason why God saves you is because he is rich in mercy. And because you and I have been broken by our sin. You know, when it comes to repentance, the posture that you and I should have is the same one that Sarah had. We should be sobbing at God's feet, devastated by the reality of our sin. We should know the punishment that we deserve. We should feel broken to pieces by the crimes we commit. When you and I ask for God's forgiveness, our posture, your posture, my posture to God, it should be one of broken apology. You know, you don't say sorry to get out of discipline because you're supposed to. You say sorry because you are devastated by what you have done. And in the most beautiful way, your brokenness leads God's mercy to melt away his anger. Your brokenness and sorrow over your sin stirs up God's compassion for you. He will take pity on you. He'll hold you in his lap and say, you deserve hell. But I'm going to give you God, I love mercy. You know, and it is one of the reasons why God saves us. Another reason why God saves us is because of his love. You know, when I was trying to decide if this is what I wanted to go through these verses for this, this series here, um, as an overview of salvation, my one hesitation uh, was that Jesus' death on the cross isn't mentioned in these ten verses. Um, right? Like, like, how can we study salvation without talking about Jesus' death on the cross? You know, but this week, while preparing for this message, I realized that Paul does mention Jesus' work on the cross. It's in the second half of verse 4. Yeah, I'm going to read it for you. I'll read the whole verse, but look at the second half. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which... He loved us. You guys, the great love with which God loved us in this verse is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's an action. This is a verb. The great love with which God loved us is Jesus' death on the cross. And, re and remember, we're trying to understand why God saves us. 
You know, we know that he does save us through Jesus' work on the cross. But why? You know, the answer that most people will give you is because he loves you. There's a problem with this answer. He has the God saves you because he loves you answer is only partially true. God's love is directed at you. God does love you. But it's only half the answer. God saves you because he loves you and because he loves justice. You see, if God's reason for saving you was only out of love for you, then he probably could just pardon you. He could probably just forgive you without killing his son. It'd, it'd be kind of like the way that a president pardons a criminal. right? When a president pardons a criminal, he doesn't have to punish someone else to pardon that person. The crime is just forgiven. If God's only reason was because he loves you, and he could simply forgive you, he wouldn't have had to go through the suffering of killing his own son. God also loves justice. It's actually in his nature. You see, if God simply pardoned you for your crimes, if he only forgave you, then he would be merciful, but unjust, because your sin would go unpunished. And it would be wrong for God to leave sin unpunished, because it goes against his nature. And then, if God only ever punished sin, then he would be just, but unmerciful, which would also be wrong for God to do, because he goes against his merciful nature. So how does God stay within his own nature of being merciful and just? How does God love you and justice? The answer is the cross. You see, the cross is where justice and mercy meet. Because of Christ's death on the cross, all of those who put their faith in Jesus are not punished for their sin, which is merciful. And also, because of Christ's death on the cross, the sins of everyone who puts their faith in Jesus were punished, which is just. You see, Jesus' death on the cross allows God to stay within his nature of being both merciful and just. You guys, the great love with which God has loved you is his love of justice to not let evil go unpunished. And his love of you to not let you be punished for your evil. All through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. This is how loving Jesus' work on the cross is. You guys, if you're sitting here and you have been a victim or you have been a witness to crimes, if you have experienced or seen the evil of the world, things like abuse of power or more recently, the shooting in Nashville, and you feel frustrated by it, you can take comfort in God's love for justice. God loves justice, and you can know and rest that all crimes will face God's justice. God will have an accounting for every sin ever committed, and God's justice is comforting to those of us hurt by sin. But if you are sitting here and you are realizing that you are the criminal, you are the one who should be punished. You're not only a victim of sin, but you are also the victimizer. You can also take comfort in God's love for you. God loves you. He will not leave you to die for your crimes. If you ask him to, 
He will save you. If in faith you believe that Christ has paid for your sin, He has saved you. You see, the cross is more than your forgiveness. The great love with which God loves you is your forgiveness and God's justice. That's why God saves you. Because he is a just God who loves you. And finally, the third reason why God saves us, found in this passage, is because he can. See, we see this in God's grace. All right, look at verse 5. It, sh it should be read like this. It says, But God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now guys, this is not a long or complicated reason, but it's vital to God's reason for saving us. Grace, when it comes in the context of salvation, is typically defined as a free gift. A gift that you did not earn. A gift that you don't deserve. A gift that you cannot compel someone to give you. But here's the thing that I want to point out about saving grace. See, gifts can only be given if the giver has the means to give it. I'll say that again. Gifts can only be given if the giver has the means to give it. See, if God, who is merciful and loves justice, didn't have the ability to give you salvation, he wouldn't. And so the implicity of this verse is that the thing tied to God's grace is his power over death. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. You guys, even if God wanted to, even if it was in his character to save us, if he did not have power over death, he would not be able to give us saving grace. But God does have power over death. Right? He showed his power over death when Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave. We just celebrated this on Easter. You guys, the tomb is empty. The resurrection of Christ is the greatest but in history. Jesus was dead. But God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, conquered death. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. But God made you alive with Christ. You know, your salvation is a gift. It's not one that you can compel God to give you. And it's not a gift that you can demand. It's not a gift that you should take lightly. And God is the only one who can give you saving grace. Because only God has power over death. Why does God's grace, why does God grace you with salvation? Because he's the only one who can. You guys, in Avatar, the last airbender, Aang saves Zuko from death. And the reason why isn't because Zuko deserved it. It's not because he manipulated Aang into doing it, or because Aang thought Zuko would pay him back. Aang saved Zuko because mercy led Aang to take pity on him. Aang saved Zuko because he is good. It is in his nature to love everyone, even his enemies. And finally, Aang saved Zuko because he could, but no one else could. And here's the cool thing. After being saved by Aang, Zuko, who is selfish, 
prideful, angry, and a violent person transformed. Being saved because of Aang's mercy, love, and grace changed Zuko's nature. He became someone kind, protective, loving, and good. And he became Aang's best friend. You guys, when you recognize how bad sin really is, when you recognize how bad your sin really is, lead you to wonder why God would save you. And verse 5, verse 4 and 5, tell us why. He saves you because he is a God of mercy. Because he is loving. Because only he can. And because God's gracious, merciful, and loving salvation changes you being a child of wrath to being one of God's children of light. You and I were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive in Christ. He did this by grace, through faith, to the glory, honor, and praise of Jesus Christ, the Lord of our salvation. Thank you.